Okay, welcome everybody. Um, today we have the privilege to um, to talk with Rose Gottemuller. She is a distinguished arms control expert with decades of service in the US government in the Departments of State and Energy, as well as the National Security Council. She was the chief negotiator of the 2010 New Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, uh, New START, which was signed by Presidents Barack Obama and Dmitry Medvedev on April 8, 2010. Currently, she's a Payne Distinguished Lecturer at Stanford University's Center for International Security and Cooperation and a Research Fellow at the Hoover Institution. She published a book this year called Negotiating the New START Treaty, which provides an insider's account of navigating international and domestic politics surrounding the negotiations in 2009 and 2010. Uh, she served as NATO Deputy Secretary General from October 2016 to October 2019, and she was, um, I'm going to go into uh, everything because I, I think our, the interests of our fellows are broad, so you can see the different, different places that she worked throughout her career, so please give me just a couple more moments um, if, you, if you don't mind. Uh, from 1998 to 2000, at the Department of Energy, she served as the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Nuclear Nonproliferation and as Assistant Secretary and Director for Nonproliferation as, as, um, and as Assistant Secretary and Director for Nonproliferation and National Security, where she was responsible for all nonproliferation cooperation with Russia and newly independent states. Um, she served as the Director of the Carnegie Moscow Center uh, from 2006 to 2008. Um, also in 1993 to 94, she served on the National Security Council staff as Director for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia Affairs with responsibility for nuclear threat reduction in Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus. Uh, she's fluent in Russian and has also worked at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London as a social scientist at the RAND Corporation and as a Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellow. She's taught on Soviet military policy and Russian security at Georgetown University. Today, she will be sharing with us her experience negotiating the New START Treaty. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Rose Gottemuller. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you so much, Alex. And it's so great to be with you all today. I have the greatest respect for this program. It's uh, really terrific. Yeah, the way Alex uh, rolled through uh, my uh, career, you'd think I couldn't hold a job, but I'm one of those classic uh, Washington types, uh, I call it a, a revolving door career, where some of my career has been spent in the think tank world at Rand Corporation, at, uh, at the Carnegie Endowment, at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London, and some of my career has been spent on the inside as a political appointee, working first for President Clinton and then for President Obama. So I've been very fortunate in my career uh, that I've had these opportunities to work both in and out of government and worked a lot with, uh, with Bill Potter there at, at Monterey uh, over the years and really feel like uh, it's, a, it's a good system for our government. So I, I welcome those of you who are in the United States and US citizens to think about your career in, in this way too, that you can spend time working in government and out of government, come and go. And in this way, I think we keep fresh ideas flowing. And I really do believe it's important. For those of you living and working elsewhere, uh, it may be a little bit more difficult, but I think the way young people's careers are developing today, uh, it will be uh, really quite inevitable that people will be moving around in their careers more. And so you may have some of those opportunities as well. But uh, I would like to do two things today. First, I'd like to talk about uh, the book uh, and particularly the lessons learned from the book because I know you're going to dive in in the next few days with the Harvard uh, negotiation group and do the boot camp activities with them. So I'll just give you kind of my point of view about, well, the lessons I learned anyway from negotiating the new START treaty and then uh, you will have to see how you apply them in the coming days. But uh, they also, I think they're very, very good. They'll have some other ideas and, and suggestions and, and put you through all kinds of interesting exercises, I'm sure. So it will be an opportunity. Uh, but the other thing I'd like to do is talk about recent developments and the way I see the strategic um, st stability dialogue unfolding at the end of July. And I think it will be at the end of July. 
I hesitated a bit on stability because uh, they have gone back to the name that was used before the Trump administration. It was the strategic security dialogue during the Trump administration, but the Biden administration has reverted to strategic stability dialogue, the SSD, which will take place, uh, I believe, at the end of July, although the final dates have yet to be confirmed. So I'll do those two things. I'll talk about lessons learned from my perspective and then give you a little taste for uh, where I think things will be going. But I'm especially glad uh, to have had the chance to, to follow on Ambassador Antonov, who was my counterpart in the negotiations, and uh, I think has probably given you a flavor for uh, Russian policy toward the United States now. Uh, that, is, uh, that is a good thing, but he's uh, really a much respected uh, professional counterpart. And uh, I think you probably saw in listening to him and perhaps being able to uh, answer or ask some questions that, uh, that he is uh, an experienced diplomat and somebody who really knows the ropes. So that's what I had to contend with uh, when I went into the negotiation of the New START Treaty. I had been fortunate in that I had just spent three years in Moscow as the director of the Carnegie Moscow Center. So Antonov and I got to know each other there. He was the director uh, of uh, the office in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs responsible for disarmament policy. So I had invited him several times to speak at the Carnegie Moscow Center. We used to go out and have lunch from time to time. He even invited me to join his advisory group in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, his advisory group of outside experts. And he actually got into some trouble, I heard afterwards, because he invited a foreign expert to join the advisory group of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But uh, it was a very, for me, it was a great opportunity to interact uh, in that setting with colleagues I had already formed at the Carnegie Moscow Center because we had a lot of seminars and work going on on nuclear disarmament policy as well as conventional arms control policy. So it was a great opportunity. I had gotten to know Antonov, I think, during that period. And I think he can say the same for me, at least in terms of our uh, professional approaches to things. And that was one of the first things I, I wanted to mention to you is that so much of what we consider to be a negotiating skill comes from having a good working relationship. You don't have to be friends with somebody, but having a good working relationship where you have some mutual respect, you know what the kind of quirks of the other person are. Uh, in Antonov's case, he was right up front with me from the outset. He said, I love to play games. I love to try to essentially mess with my counterpart. That was his constant refrain. And so I took, took that and said, okay, well, two can play games. I don't need to put up with that. Uh, Duke can play games. So, uh, but I think in a way, the fact that we had a good understanding from the outset of, of the other's character and personality, as well as experience base, was, was rather important to the success uh, of our working together on negotiation of the, the New START Treaty. In his case, I'll just tell a little vignette that uh, we had an article come out early in the negotiations in June of 2009, it came out in a Russian military uh, newspaper. And basically the author uh, said, oh, she, Gautamuller is such a tough negotiator that uh, her counterpart Antonov is never gonna be able to get the better of her at the negotiating table. Well, this was not addressed to me. This was a swipe at Antonov. And I think, frankly, I think it has to do with the typical misogyny of, of the Russian system. And I know there are some colleagues and, uh, some fellows here from, from Russia and other countries in the region. I just say, well, you can, you can uh, talk about your own experience, but in my case, I was well aware of it from my many years working uh, in the Soviet system and uh, with Soviet and Russian counterparts. So I said, okay, this is not about me. This is about uh, the first woman to negotiate a strategic arms reduction uh, treaty and they're going to take a swipe at Antonov uh, in the course of uh, basically, we were at that time in the introductory phases of the negotiations. So the dynamics were still being set up between our two delegations. Well, I feared that it meant that he was about to be replaced as the chief negotiator. But in the end of the day, what it meant was that he heightened the kind of tempo of his games playing and really did everything he could to knock me off balance. And I think, you know, fair enough. Fair enough, he had to, uh, to prove that he was uh, 
clearly uh, a leader of his delegation and somebody who could keep the United States on its toes and if necessary off balance. And that meant not only me as the chief negotiator, but also the de delegation as a whole. I think over time we worked through that. I started my own little series of games, uh, drawing out the women on his delegation and uh, really nagging him a lot to allow a woman to sit at the front table during plenary sessions and deliver talking points. It was always the men who were allowed to speak. The women had to sit in the back row, back against the wall and were never allowed to speak, except of course, the very capable interpreters who were always women on the Russian side, uh, but nobody else was allowed to speak. And finally, after months of nagging, his very capable chief lawyer on the delegation was allowed to come to the front and to speak and to deliver some official talking points to us. And when she came to the front table, she said, well, at last I'm allowed to speak. And then she settled into her uh, presentation, which was some you know, important legal business, but more or less routine to the negotiations. But it was very funny that I think uh, on um, the Russian side of the table, they began to notice that I was, I was playing these games and I wasn't only nagging Antonov, but kind of delivering some wider messages as well. I don't think it's gonna make uh, a big difference in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. I hope someday to see a female ambassador uh, arise who is not a, a political figure, but uh, not so far. So, but we'll see. I continue trying to, to push every chance I get. So that's um, one lesson learned, but another lesson learned, which is really the most important. And I wanted to bring it back to that point, the most important thing is to have a clear idea at the outset of what your national security interests are and what you need to do to accomplish them. And that uh, leads to the importance of having clear instructions from the highest level possible. In the case of the New START treaty negotiations, we were extremely lucky because President Obama at that time met with then President Dmitry Medvedev in April of 2009 in London, and they issued very succinct and simple negotiating instructions to us. It was really three main points. One, that we should negotiate as quickly as possible a follow-on to the START Treaty. The START Treaty had entered into force in 1994 and was going out of force in December of 2009. So we really had a very short period between April and December to try to get the treaty finished. The second main point was that uh, we should negotiate to achieve further reductions in strategic offensive armaments. And the third major point was that this treaty was to be about strategic offensive arms, not strategic defensive arms. And so these three instructions were all important throughout the course of the negotiations. And they really outlined the high priority that the president of the United States and the president of the Russian Federation were placing on further limitations and reductions in strategic offensive forces. They were clearly stating the national security interest of our two countries in achieving that goal. And so that was a, a big help uh, in terms of, uh, of being able to lay out the negotiations of how we were going to proceed. I will say also that it was very important we had that clear instruction that this negotiation was about reducing and limiting strategic offensive forces because for many years, really almost since the demise of the anti-ballistic missile treaty, uh, in uh, 2002, the Russians uh, had been trying to resume limits, legally binding limits on US national missile defenses. And that is, we can talk about this in the Q&A if you like, but it's a major political issue in the United States and impossible in my view for any president on either side of the aisle to limit US national missile defenses. So as a result of that, uh, we, we had these clear instructions and the Russians kept bringing it up because I believe this was not really a settled issue in Moscow and then Prime Minister Putin made it his signature issue and he almost blew up the negotiations over it in, uh, in December of 2009. But in the end of the day, uh, I believe that President Medvedev stepped forward and said, no, we are going to continue with these negotiations and conclude them. And so we did so, not by December of 2009 when START went out of force, but by April of 2009 
when uh, the treaty uh, was signed, and then we took it forward to the process of advice and consent in uh, the US Senate. The Russians proceeded with the same, although they very carefully waited until we ratified first, and then they finished their ratification process. Uh, they learned their lesson from earlier experiences, including uh, the START II, so-called START II treaty during President Clinton's term in office. When they ratified first in the United States, uh, never proceeded and finished the ratification process. So they waited around for us, but, but that was okay. Now I get asked a lot whether there was uh, something special uh, about being the first woman negotiator of a strategic arms reduction treaty in terms of lessons learned. And if you have a chance to read the book, you will see that we were under a huge amount of political pressure from Washington and a huge amount actually of uh, pressure on me personally as the chief negotiator to speed up the pace of negotiations, to not let the Russians leave the table. In fact, Washington was telling me that we could not come home for Christmas in 2009, even though the Russians were leaving to go back to celebrate their New Year's holidays because they wanted us to send a message to Moscow that this was so urgent for President Obama that we had to stay at the negotiating table even though they went back to Moscow. This was a bit silly uh, in my view, but and it was reversed because honestly, it wasn't all about going home for the holidays. It was time for us to take a break. You have to take a break and go back to capital sometimes and then take time to work with the interagency to develop new guidance, to develop new positions on particular issues. These are strategic nuclear weapons after all, critical to the national security of the United States. So if we are going to have, for example, a solid monitoring and verification regime, we have to work carefully with the Air Force and the Navy to ensure that their interests are served. They don't want their operational tempo to be hampered by verification procedures under the treaty. So all of those kinds of things have to be worked out in capital. So it wasn't just we were going home to have fun with our families over Christmas. We had actual work to do. And so I'm happy that eventually the White House reversed that position, but it was it was touch and go for a while. And people have said to me since the book came out, well, isn't this evidence of really strong misogyny that you experience this kind of pressure? And I have to tell you, no, I, I did have my share of, uh, I would say misogyny. Uh, and you may have seen the article in Politico about how my own delegation demanded that I pound the table and yell and kind of jump up and down with the Russians to prove that I could lose my temper. And uh, yeah, I did that. It was a little bit of street theater, as I call it in the book, because normally I have a very even, even temper, even approach to how I talk uh, at the negotiating table or elsewhere. But uh, they wanted to see some temper, so I gave them some. And I never really had to lose my temper again, although I did one more time in November of 2009 when it became evident that I wasn't sure it was Putin at that point, but somebody at a high level in Moscow was meddling with our ability to reach, uh, to reach agreement and to reach important uh, consensus agreement on some key issues. And so we saw the Russians taking about 10 steps back in the negotiation at that time. I lost my temper again on that occasion, but it was not, again, in that situation, street theater, it was because the Russians had truly begun to step backwards from what we had accomplished so far. But uh, back to the question of misogyny, I really uh, do think that this is the kind of pressure that all negotiators come under from the capital, because the capital has a wide range of concerns, including political concerns, and a wide range of interlocutors, including in the case of President Obama and his White House, Capitol Hill who were very closely watching the negotiations and wanting to make sure that certain aspects were treated uh, in, the, in the negotiations and turned up in the, in the treaty. So they had their own imperatives and they began to increasingly uh, pressure us in ways that were rather uncomfortable. I frankly think they did not understand. It had been many years since START was negotiated. I worked on the first START negotiations in 1990 and 1991. START took six years on and off to negotiate this first START treaty. So the notion that we were going to negotiate a new treaty in nine months uh, was really unprecedented. Um, not even nine months, eight months was unprecedented. And I don't think that the White House understood that, that this amount of technical detail was going to take time to work out. 
So that is one of the reasons that I say in my lessons learned chapter, there can be no such thing as drive-by negotiations. You have to have sustained delegation work. You have to be able to sit with your counterparts. Again, it's that element of developing mutual trust that I talked about right at the beginning, but it's also just the fact that if you're talking about intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles and submarine launch ballistic missiles and bombers and submarines and you know, air launch crews, these are technical matters that really you have to treat carefully because it's in the national security of the United States to enter into an arms control deal, yes, but we don't wanna give up sensitive secrets at the same time about uh, the designs of our nuclear weapons systems. So for that reason, when you're working out monitoring and verification, you wanna make sure the procedures are very careful so that you can understand that the Russians are complying, they can understand that we are complying, complying with the treaty, but you are not giving up sensitive secrets at the same time, and both sides have that interest. Again, I don't think the White House got that, I ended up in a lot of trouble. My delegation was under constant pressure because of it. But in the end of the day, we, we gained the extra months that we needed to work through and complete the process. And it was really, uh, from the time we began, uh, we spent nine, it was a year total, uh, April to April to negotiate the treaty, but we spent about nine months total in Geneva working with the Russian delegation. And it was that sustained delegation uh, work that made all the difference. So again, no such thing as drive-by negotiations. You can't take a trip to Geneva and in two days expect to get a lot of technical work done. It's just not possible. You have to have the technical experts who are we weapon system operators or uh, inspectors who have worked on previous inspection regimes. You have to have them be able to sit down for months at a time and work out very careful procedures. So Bottom line is, I don't think I particularly suffered from misogyny. I think I suffered from the kind of uh, kind of pressure that happens on all delegations uh, when they are out in the field and struggling to make progress. Uh, the capital frequently becomes impatient. So, if you have an opportunity, I don't know if you're going to hear from Ambassador Linton Brooks or Ambassador Rick, Richard Burt who are the chief negotiators of the START Treaty, the first Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, you should ask them this question too. They will tell you they were under tremendous pressure and it was very, very difficult uh, to carry forward sometimes the work under pressure from, from Washington. And in fact, Washington loves to send out people to, uh, to lecture and uh, how shall I put it, bring higher level decision-making to bear. And that's not a bad thing. It helps sometimes to get the treaty over the finish line. And in my case, it was true also, in our case, it was true also. Ellen Tauscher, with a very experienced senior, uh, senior expert named James Timby, well-known in the arms control community in the United States, they came out in March at the last minute and brought some important things over, over the uh, finish line for the New START Treaty. So, uh, let me think. I think at this point I'm going to shift gears because I wanted to talk a little bit, and I see I've already been talking 20 minutes, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what I expect for the upcoming Strategic Stability Dialogue, the SSD. And for your reference, uh, if you'd like to uh, listen to the uh, keynote address of Sergei Rybkov, the Deputy Foreign Minister, at the Carnegie Nonproliferation Conference three weeks ago, it's now up on YouTube. You can go to the Carnegie website and find it. Uh, I was the person who was questioning him and drawing him out on certain issues. But it's clear to me that there are certain key aspects of the Russian position that they are already putting on the table. And one in particular is very, very welcome. The one that is very, very welcome has to do with the fact that uh, the Russians are changing their demand that the U.S. limit its national missile defenses. As I mentioned when I started talking about, you know, the New START negotiations and their concern about the demise of the ABM Treaty in 2002, so trying to limit our national missile defenses all this time, now all of a sudden they have begun to say, okay, we recognize we want to limit your national missile defenses, 
but we've started saying to them, we're concerned about your missile defense developments. Your new missile defense technologies are very capable. The so-called S-500 system, very capable. So we've started to say to them, we are concerned about your new missile defense technologies. And so I'm very glad that now, and in the Carnegie remarks, Sergei Ripkoff was clear about this, they are ready to make this a two-way street, a two-way discussion, and essentially to allow each of us uh, some, uh, some ability to have limited missile defenses on our territory. Limited means that we can defend against certain threats. We always say we wanna be able to defend against the DPRK and its limited missile threat to the United States. They of course say they wanna defend against uh, NATO, against Europe. I could argue with that because they've got plenty of missiles pointed at Europe as well. But nevertheless, we both feel that we have limited uh, threats that, on a regional basis that we want to defend against. So that uh, mutual agreement to have limited missile defenses on national territory, I think is a really interesting step on the Russian side. They've also begun to indicate a willingness to uh, proceed with a freeze on all nuclear weapons. This was a proposal that President Trump first put on the table to have a freeze on all nuclear warheads. Uh, this is a very important precedent because historically, we never directly limited warheads in a strategic arms reduction treaty. We limited uh, the warheads by their association with their missile system. So if a missile system had 10 warheads uh, on it, once that missile was eliminated, was destroyed, those 10 warheads went back into storage. And uh, we said, okay, for purposes of being a direct threat to the United States, we consider them to be gone. They've been eliminated for purposes of this treaty, even though they still are very much alive and existing in storage and could be returned in future to, uh, to a missile. So that's another important development that the Russians have uh, been articulating that they are willing to take a new look at a warhead freeze uh, which is just a unilateral gesture. It doesn't have any monitoring or verification, but to then transform that over time as we take steps to put in place a very complex and difficult verification regime. Again, both the United States and Russia are going to want to protect in every way they can sensitive warhead design details. So the verification, the monitoring regime is going to have to be very carefully developed so that it does not give up secrets of that kind. So there'll be work to do. Uh, in fact, I'm engaged in a really interesting project now with a, another colleague at, uh, at Monterey, at the CNS, uh, Miles Pomper, to look at how we might limit non-strategic nuclear warheads that are deployed uh, in Europe, uh, including in NATO countries, but also very much on Russian uh, missile systems. So the last thing I think that's important about the way the Russian position is now starting to take shape and to, uh, to show some, some substance is the way they seem to be sorry that they let the INF Treaty go, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty that limited shorter range systems that are uh, able to attack without warning very critical targets such as national command and control targets, national command authority targets, as we call them. So INF was in force uh, for many, many years, and uh, it essentially kept uh, that short warning attack threat at bay for both the United States and its NATO allies and for the Russian Federation. The Russians began violating the treaty with the deployment of a new missile of intermediate range called the 9M729. These are ground launched missiles. They began deploying it about five years ago. And at that point, the United States called them out in violation of the treaty. And uh, the Trump administration decided to withdraw from the treaty because the Russians weren't taking any steps uh, to uh, deal with the 9M729. Now, uh, they have agreed that they'd be willing to take the 9M729 out of Europe and deploy it only east of the Urals in Asia. And so again, Ribkoff was talking at this uh, Carnegie Nonproliferation Conference about having a kind of three, three phased approach to limiting intermediate range ground launch missile systems. The first would be to get them out of Kaliningrad. The second would be to get them out of European Russia. 
And the third step would be to proceed with some uh, efforts to limit intermediate range uh, missiles of this uh, kind in Asia. And that brings in, of course, the thought of having China at the table, which is a very interesting possibility and something I think we should be working on. So that's how I think the, the Russian position is going to take shape for the strategic stability dialogue. Uh, there will be other issues as well, but on the U.S. side, we are most concerned both about getting a, a handle on U.S. non-strategic warheads that are deployed and capable of threatening NATO countries in Europe. Those go on shorter range uh, missile systems, uh, but they would be included in an all warhead ban or freeze or limit. So I think that's you know, a, a good step already in the direction of what we are trying to get at, which is uh, these shorter range systems on the Russian side. And we're also very concerned about these so-called exotic Russian systems, such as the nuclear propelled cruise missile and the nuclear propelled torpedo that uh, are just now uh, entering into deployment and they seem uh, very uh, well, difficult to operate, very dangerous to operate. You may have heard two summers ago how, how one of them exploded in the White Sea and uh, really killed some, some of the scientists and, and experts working on, working on the missile system. So I think they're very dangerous to operate because they are propelled by nuclear reactors, very dangerous to operate, uh, highly radioactive. So I'm hopeful actually, the US wants to get controls on them, get limits on them, really stop their deployment. So I'm hopeful that the Russians will see the difficulty of continuing to deploy them and will figure out ways uh, themselves uh, to agree to come to the negotiating table to work on that. Of course, they'll, they'll have something on their side. You don't give something for nothing. So they're going to ask for some constraints on US systems. And so far they seem most uh, worried about so-called prompt global strike systems, conventionally armed, highly accurate, long range conventional missile systems. So I have a feeling that that's what they're going to put on the table to try to get some controls on, on these exotic systems that, that we want. Uh, they, they will want controls on the conventional systems and we will want controls on these exotic systems. So um, that's as we set up the next negotiation of a treaty. But the other good thing I think about the strategic stability dialogue coming up is there'll be a, another category of discussions to talk about emerging and disruptive technologies and their implications for our strategic nuclear deterrent forces. And so that will be a separate discussion. It's not going to fold into an eventual treaty negotiation, but will be a separate discussion that I think is highly valuable because I think we're all concerned that some of the emerging and disruptive technologies, whether they, they are cyber technologies already uh, well in existence at the present time, or some of the newer uh, technologies in the quantum arena, nobody knows where they will take us. So I think it's a good thing to be talking about this matter with the Russians and figuring out together what some of the uh, implications may be for a stable balance, a stable deterrence balance between our two countries and particularly between our two uh, strategic nuclear force structures. So with that, I've actually been talking uh, a good long time and I wanna leave plenty of time for your questions and comments. So I'm going to turn the floor back over to you, Alex, to, uh, to manage the discussion. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much, Rose, for um, that uh, commentary on uh, some lessons that we'll be able to apply directly in this uh, this Harvard negotiation boot camp this week, but also um, just as as we watch uh, what what's next un unfold uh, uh, really uh, very, very soon. So colleagues, as you have questions, you can raise your hand and I'll come to you. I have, I have a couple of questions, but I'll start with just uh, with one question. Um, so uh, earlier uh, today, we had a lecture and discussion with Dr. Alexei Arbatov. Um, and he mentioned uh, like one of the foundational uh, discussions for New Start was uh, starting an arms reduction with eliminating first strike potential. As you mentioned, this offensive focus uh, for for that negotiation, and uh, and he mentioned for continuing dialogue uh, like these strategic stability dialogues, we would need to find uh, a sort of similar agreement about reducing technical capability. So the, these these uh, were. 
the things that you mentioned um, that reduce political decision making time. Do you do you think uh, with with your understanding of also uh, uh, negotiating with Congress, uh, so to speak, for like how how we can see what it, the political will is for for moving forward? Do you think that there could be uh, uh, potential for for starting with um, this increase of political decision making time and focusing on that as as a, as a driver for the technical discussion. I think that's an important goal uh, to pursue in in any um, circumstances with regard to maintaining uh, the stability of our uh, strategic nuclear deterrent. And so we've tried to build that into various uh, treaties. Uh, historically, we've tried to build that into various treaties. I think. Now uh, there could be some direct attention, uh, for example, and I don't know if Alexei brought this up this morning or not, but the implications of cyber attacks on NCA, on, on National Command Authority, the, the nuclear command and control capabilities of each nation. We, we have a mutual interest in ensuring that we are not meddling with, uh, with our nuclear command and control in a way that would, uh, would either shrink decision time or destroy decision time. Uh, impede decision making uh, in that way. So I think that there seems, as I read what I'm uh, seeing from Russian experts and uh, listen to, to their comments, and I know on our, our side uh, of the table, there's a lot of interest in looking at some of those areas first. Can we have some agreements? And yes, they are, one might say, gentlemen's agreements. Uh, they are politically binding. They're uh, not legally binding because it's very difficult to foresee any kind of monitoring of, of cyber activity in a way that would permit you to monitor for compliance with a legally binding agreement. But I do think just having those kinds of discussions and uh, a mutual recognition that we have, uh, we both have an interest in maintaining the stability of decision making with regard to nuclear weapons uh, in the unlikely but dire uh, event that there is, uh, there is a, a nuclear crisis unfolding. So, so I think there's a, some real opportunity there. If I may, I'll just comment on your other question uh, that was a, a, a bit present as well, that is about the, the Senate and their interest. Um, it's, you know, there's not a whole lot of substantive knowledge of these issues in the Senate anymore. So that's one of the things that my colleagues and I who are now in the expert community are trying to do is, is constantly try to develop some more uh, understanding of what the major issues are. Uh, the new START ratification process itself was valuable in that regard. But the other thing I'll say is that the, the senators, um, when they see an interest served, it makes them more willing to vote in favor of a treaty. Again, coming back to my early point about national security interests must be clear, they must be front and center, and everybody has to understand them. So when the senators understand them, um, then yes, they're more likely to, to pay attention to a ratification process and then vote for a treaty. In the next Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, I think this matter of getting constraints on Russian non-strategic warheads, this is an issue that's well understood on both sides of the aisle. And I think if we are able to get good uh, constraints on the Russian non-strategic warheads in the context of a limit on all warheads, and include very strong verification monitoring measures, uh, I think that this will be a, a good reason for the treaty to find favor, not only on the Democratic side of the aisle, but also on the Republican side of the aisle. That's, that's my supposition anyway. Thanks so much. Um, the first question from the fellows is uh, John C. Stenko. Thanks, Alex. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Um, I guess a quick introduction. So I'm, my name is John. I'm a doctoral student in international relations at Indiana University. My question, I guess, builds a bit on what you were just talking about with, you know, making sure senators and other politicians are informed on the national interest and, and pushing them towards that. Going back to what you talked about with you know, Washington kind of putting pressure on you and, you know, prior negotiators as well to get this done and, you know, to get a deal that, you know, original start took several years and they want this done in less than a year. Does it ever get to a point, you know, thinking about the Harvard negotiation boot camp that we did last week and are going to do this week again, do you get to a point where your, 
I don't want to say a bad treaty is signed, but a suboptimal one is reached because you are having to make concessions to um, to fall in line with political and or ideological goals back home, as opposed to strictly operating on the national interest. Well, that's a good question because uh, treaties are also uh, obviously political documents. And so the way I think about it, John, is uh, first of all, obviously any treaty comes about because of compromise. You cannot take your entire wish list to the other party and slam it on the table and say, agree or not, that's just not gonna work. So you always have in your negotiating position, you always have some flexibility to, uh, to give as you get, you know, but you wanna look for fair compromises. You wanna be able to also at the end of the day, make a clear case that the compromise continues to be in US national security interest and that you didn't quote, give away the store, which is always, that's the, the fear that any negotiator has that they'll be accused of giving away the store. So it has to be a fair balance. You give a little, you get a little, and, and throughout the process of negotiation, you're paying attention to the, the, the puts and takes, so to say, so that you come out with a product that you can then defend and say, yeah, we had to give up some things, but, but look what we got for it. And this is definitely in our national security interest. But the other thing I would say uh, is that because treaties are political documents, oftentimes uh, a treaty will have with it some very clear statements of these political, uh, these political necessities. Uh, and one way to do that is to put it into the preamble of the treaty, which is usually, a, as I mentioned in the book, it's kind of a hortatory list of, of what the treaty is supposed to accomplish. So you can put it there. The other way we did it, and this is one of the ways we fixed the missile defense problem in the new START treaty, is we had some side letters and they were not uh, an inherent part of the treaty. They were you know, political documents. They weren't legally binding. But we were able to say in our side letter, this is our position. We are not trying with our national missile defense system to undermine the strategic offensive deterrent of the Russian Federation. And then the Russian letter essentially acknowledged our position and stated their own position about their concerns that the US could at some point break out. But you see, there's ways to, um, to serve the political needs uh, that every, you know, every side has in a, in a treaty document but do it in a way that's not an inherent part of the treaty, that is not legally binding, that doesn't place us under any legal constraints or, or obligations, but allows that political point of view to be expressed. And those, those tools are sometimes not well understood. In fact, it's funny, one of the episodes in the book, because I was you know, racking my brain, they, I knew that we were um, seeing pressure from Moscow, pressure from Putin, particularly after December of 2009. And I was kind of racking my brains about how to do this to give them something that they needed for their political um, masters, but do it in a way that wouldn't affect the, the legally binding obligations of the treaty. So I, um, I remembered START and how many of those political side letters and side statements were made in START. So I sat down with Antonov during Snowmageddon. I don't know if, well, where you were in those years, John, if you were out in Indiana, you are used to snow anyway, but Snowmageddon in Washington in, in February of 2010 basically shut the city down for a whole week. So I wasn't getting any instructions. So I sat down with Anatoly and I said, let's, let's work out some side letters. You know, let's just work it out and send it back to Washington and you send it to Moscow and we'll see if we can use this as a tool to scratch your itch and vice versa. Well, I sent it back to Washington during Snowmageddon, and somehow it landed directly in President Obama's inbox, and he got furious at me. If you don't know what it's like to have a president furious at you, I can assure you it's not a pleasant experience. But, he, you know, again, it was that lack of kind of uh, knowledge of what had gone before. I think I'm not blaming anybody, certainly not President Obama, but he just didn't understand this mechanism of having political statements or political uh, side letters that have been used in the past. And to me, it was quite normal because I think there were, there were only a couple in New START, but there were, there were close to 20 side letters or political statements attached to the START treaty. So for me, it was very, very normal. But that's the thing uh, and why I think it's important to continue to work to also uh, no drive-by negotiations, but work also to try to impart some of this knowledge of what the past precedents are 
and uh, how the treaty can be made to work to solve some political issues as well as ensuring the right legal obligations. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your question, John. Uh, Jana, please. Thank you very much, Alex, and thank you so much, Rose, for your time with us today. Uh, my name is Jana, and I am a graduate student at UCLA in the Slavic department. And my question is um, related to, um, to what you mentioned in the beginning of your talk, uh, where you outlined an impact of an article in Russian media that questioned your counterparts and Tanov's ability to deal with the American side represented by a woman. And I was wondering, when negotiations on issues can take several years, um, how do you manage the media and public opinion um, throughout all these years? Thank you so much. Yes, that is also a very good uh, question, Yana. And I think the most important thing, and you can tell that a negotiation is beginning to go well when, because one always, uh, says uh, to one's counterparts, let's not do megaphone diplomacy. Let's not negotiate in the press. Let us keep our diplomatic discussions confidential and really try to make progress without leaks to the press and without going to the press with messages for the other side. And I think that's an important part of seeing that the momentum is picking up in a negotiation and that the two sides are trusting each other when that confidentiality of the negotiating process essentially takes hold and holds firm. Um, from time to time, I had some trouble with leaks. Uh, I think they came directly from Antono, but it wasn't a big deal. And I usually you know, say, hey, we agreed, no megaphone diplomacy, no, no negotiating with the press. And, and then we get back to our kind of confidential diplomatic exchanges and that worked, that worked really well. But I think it is so important for a negotiation to be successful, for that to be the case. And you'll notice in other negotiations that have been successful, like the JCPOA negotiations as well. Uh, I did not lead those. They were led by, well, John Kerry himself as Secretary of State uh, took a big role in those, but Wendy Sherman, the Undersecretary uh, for Policy, who's now the Deputy Secretary of State, she led the JCPOA negotiations. They kept them very much under wraps. And everybody had an interest, you know, the Iranians, they had their own tough customers to deal with back in Tehran and uh, in uh, you know, the European and among the Europeans, they too were dealing with some tough issues. So I think it was important early on that that confidentiality took hold for the success of the JCPOA negotiation. So that's my main point. I think it's a sign that a negotiation is failing if that megaphone diplomacy takes over and people are just delivering messages in the press. That, that to me shows that a negotiation is, is actually failing or needs, it needs some kind of uh, short, sharp shock. Maybe the presidents need to engage so that they can get back to the negotiating table and do so in a confidential manner. Thank you. Uh, Yang Yang, please, your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for talking with us today. Um, I am a graduate student at Georgetown University in the Center for uh, Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies. Um, in our conversation with uh, Dr. Alexey Rabatov today, we talked about the complexities of involving China and other third countries in arms control talks. Um, particularly, there were two uh, issues, one uh, with turning a bilateral forum into a multilateral one, and number two, uh, making the Chinese side feel like it is in their best interest to engage in arms control talks, given that their nuclear stockpile is much, much smaller than that of either Russia or the United States. So my, my question is, how do you envision these two issues being resolved um, if we are to bring third countries into arms control talks? Thank you. Well, I'll give you my answer, uh, and then I'll, I want to hear more about what uh, Ambassador Antonov said. So <laughs> I have basically uh, two answers. Uh, first, um, I think we need to remain uh, very clear about, again, what will China's interest be in coming to a negotiating table? You're quite right that their numbers of strategic offensive uh, forces are so much lower and their number of warheads, their, their, you know, their general number of warheads so much lower than the United States and the Russian Federation. We and the Russians still have 90% of the nuclear weapons in the world, despite years and years of reducing and eliminating 
nuclear weapons and, and nuclear weapon force structure. So China quite rightly said to the Trump administration, no, we're not going to come to the table. And frankly, I think it kind of lent this air of encouragement that they should build up, that they should build up to Russian and US numbers, which I think uh, is a really bad idea. And we should not encourage that. Now, I know the Chinese are modernizing and building up somewhat, so we have to keep a sharp eye on what they are doing, but they are not going to suddenly appear with the same number of weapons uh, and weapon systems that the US and Russia has. So in other words, as I like to say, we will have strategic warning if the Chinese are suddenly going to build up to the levels that, that we have. So we keep, keep a sharp eye but otherwise uh, try to encourage them to sustain and maintain a, uh, a moderate approach to uh, modernizing their nuclear, nuclear forces. So what then will be their interest in coming to the negotiating table? To my mind, it resides in areas where China has some equivalence of capability. And there are three areas that I think are especially promising for that. One is intermediate range ground launch uh, missile systems, so called INF systems, conventional and nuclear. A second is uh, space capabilities with a lot of new and very capable Chinese space technology uh, being launched. And the third area is hypersonic glide vehicles. So, I think that the Chinese will see their interests engaged because they have some equivalents. They will have some negotiating room and they may have, an, I would think they would have an interest in keeping US intermediate range ground launched missile systems out of deployment in Asia. In fact, I've already seen some signals of that from Chinese experts in, in working with them. So I think that there are possibilities for some, uh, some negotiations with the Chinese. It's just not on the strategic offensive force posture, the intercontinental range uh, offensive force posture where the US and Russia have some equivalents and have been, we've been negotiating and reaching uh, treaties and agreements for many, many years. On your question, bilat versus multilat, I don't think we need to worry so much about this. My own point of view is we see first what the substance of the negotiations is and then decide whether uh, that is uh, a negotiation that would be best uh, undertaken on a bilateral basis or on a multilateral basis. The Chinese after all have participated in multilateral negotiations over the years. They were very positive and I would say productive contributors to the JCPOA negotiations that we were just talking about a few moments ago. Uh, and actually took some responsibility for addressing uh, the elimination of the heavy water reactor in Iran. So they have you know, done some heavy lifting at, the at that negotiating table. There are also parties to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, so they've been involved in multilateral negotiations over time. We, I, I think we just don't need to worry about this so much. Let's figure out what the substance of the negotiations is and then figure out who needs to be at the table. I could see a trilateral negotiation in Asia uh, between and among the US, Russia, and China to uh, ensure that no intermediate range ground launch missile systems, uh, well, that they are either banned or limited uh, with monitoring and verification to go along with it. But you know, the Russians say they will encourage China to come to the table, but they don't want to sit at the same table with the United States and China. So, maybe it won't be a multilateral negotiation. But I don't think we need to worry about that right now. Let's just figure out what substance would be engaging to China, what would engage China's national security interests, and then figure out what the negotiating uh, setup would look like. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yang Lang. Uh, Jack, please, your question. Thank you, Alex. Um, and thank you, Rose, for spending time with us today. Um, I'm a master's student at McGill University, um, and a reoccurring theme of the symposium so far, um, starting from our keynote module, um, has been the need for imaginative policy solutions. Um, and I'm curious, given your long career, uh, where have you seen the role of imagination uh, play kind of the strongest um, at the negotiation table? Mm. <laughs> wow. That's a great question. Um, 
Well, it's memory as well as imagination because the role of precedence is always very powerful. I mentioned the fact that um, I got into trouble with President Obama for suggesting a longstanding precedent that we'd have these uh, some, an exchange of political side letters uh, on the missile defense issue. Um, so memory is important and the precedents that are associated with, uh, with uh, earlier negotiations. But then imagination comes in uh, in how you put the solution sets together. I, I think in, in my experience, it's never a, a single uh, a kind of single uh, step that you take that brings a negotiation fully across the finish line. There are all kinds of ways that you have to think through, again, what will engage the other side, what will suit his political needs, as well as his national security needs. Uh, and he has, he or she has to do the same uh, for you. So it's a, a constant effort to take uh, the building blocks that are that are taking shape, for example, political side letters. Where I had a I had a really uh, wonderful, experienced negotiator working with me called Kurt Seaman from the Department of Energy, and he was a genius for putting together uh, little exchanges on definitions. You wouldn't believe how important accurate definitions are that both sides agree to to making for a successful treaty because everybody has to understand what's in the treaty the same way, right? So the definitions are super important. He was really imaginative about, you know, understanding what little packages of definitions would, would go together in a way that would suit the Russians' interests. And then we had, of course, our interests expressed also by that little package. So sometimes it's just, it's the smallest things but they come together into the building blocks. And then in the end of the day, uh, I think sometimes it takes imaginations to, to finally fit the building blocks in place uh, in a way that, uh, that suits both sides, both security purposes and, and political purposes. So it's a, it's, a great, um, it's a great question. And one other thing I'll point to in our negotiations, because we had already heard, again, from our Navy and our Air Force that they didn't want the full array of start um, inspections because they had become very burdensome to the operations of the Navy and the Air Force. Anytime the Russians you know, come to a US Air Force base to look at a nuclear weapon system, it shuts down base operations for days. You cannot continue with your you know, normal operations while the Russians are there. Again, you're protecting the site from uh, giving up sensitive information. So we already had clear instructions from the Navy and the Air Force. They wanted to see some streamlining of the inspection regime and we could not figure out how to do it. So again, I recount this in the book, how one of my very senior guys, Ted Warner, former Air Force Colonel, uh, but now retired, worked at RAND for many years and was in uh, DOD as well. He said, okay, let me sit down. You guys go back to Washington at the end of one of our plenary rounds, go back to Washington for a few weeks. I'm gonna stay here with all the experts, both the inspectors and the weapon system operators. And we're gonna figure out how to streamline the inspection regime. And by God, they did it. And in a way that the Russians immediately could see that it served their interests as well. So that was a, that was a good case in the negotiations uh, when I, essentially set the experts loose and let them think through the problem. And they figured out, I think, an imaginative result. So it's a kind of mixed, <laughs> mixed answer to your question, Jack. Sometimes it's, uh, it's taking those earlier historical precedents and building them into the building blocks and figuring out how that works. But sometimes it really is uh, thinking uh, up some new ideas. So it's uh, maybe not a very, uh, uh, it's a messy answer, but I, I hope that uh, I hope that'll get you thinking anyway. That's great. Thank you very much for that that answer. Um, uh, Marguerite, please uh, your question next. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Um, I mean, you've already taught our all of us so much, and I've I've watched you uh, speaking with Dmitry Trinin, and you're definitely you know fighting against that uh, memory block that we want to avoid. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, for the negotiation this week um, in the boot camp, 
uh, we were told to focus on implementation. So the first one we didn't we didn't think too much about that. Uh, we just you know fixed Ukraine and moved on. Um, but this week <laughs> this week we, we we want I was wondering kind of about the relationship between um, implementation and a good working relationship and the type of assurance to which you're able to get assurances from that for later on. Thank you, Marguerite. Would you just say uh, where where you are, where you're studying? Oh, I'm studying in Oxford. At Oxford. Okay, thank you. Um, well, implementability is uh, on everybody's mind, and we didn't have a very good uh, early history on implementability because at the time in the 1970s, when we got started with the Soviet Union to try to limit strategic offensive forces, the Russians did not want on-site inspectors on their territory at all. And so we were dependent on so-called national technical means, uh, big uh, national satellites, uh, reconnaissance aircraft, over the horizon tar um, radar capabilities to basically try to track what they were doing with their strategic nuclear forces. And at the time, again, we're talking about 50 years ago now, they didn't quite understand that if they didn't want on-site inspection, they were going to have to permit open access. In other words, they could not impede our national technical means. And so they put up, you know, uh, like netting over their ICBM sites, all kinds of ways to spoof and, and uh, decoy our national technical needs. And so that became a big issue in so the first strategic arms limitation treaty, SALT one with people saying they're just not cooperating with implementation. You know, they, may, they must not really want this treaty because they're not, well, it was not a treaty actually, it was an agreement, an executive agreement. They must not really want this agreement because they're not co cooperating with implementation. So that was a big lesson learned, to be honest with you. And afterwards, we had some long negotiations with the Soviets and then with the Russians after the Soviet Union broke apart to really get them to understand a compliance and uh, ability to understand clearly that the other party is complying is the only way these treaties were going to succeed and that they were going to get what they wanted, which is real limits on US strategic offensive forces. They had to comply for us to be willing to reduce and eliminate our systems. So obviously they didn't do it because they thought we were nice or because, uh, you know, because we asked them, but because they got what they wanted out of complying with the treaty. And of course we got what we wanted, but it was a long battle. It was only with the advent of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty in the mid 1980s that the Russians finally agreed to on-site inspection. And that has made a big, big difference because then we, we do understand uh, and have a better uh, ability to understand what's going on uh, in, uh, the Russian missile bases and so forth, and it really helps uh, with the compliance problem. So it's that old uh, Ronald Reagan cliche, trust but verify. And uh, in the case of the strategic arms limitation and now reduction treaties, we have 50 years of experience with the Russians, Soviets and the Russians. So now also there's an accumulation of experience. And I think they have decided over time, again, it serves their interest because they are sure that we are reducing and eliminating an equal interest on our side. By the way, although the Russians cheated on the INF Treaty by deploying the 9M729, their compliance record has been very good. It was good with regard to START, and it's been good with regard to the new START Treaty. So clearly, they do see that their interests are served uh, by the treaty. Thank you. Uh for the answer. And thanks, Marguerite, for asking that question. I actually wanted to follow up on implementation as well. So uh, Sophie, please, your, your question next. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you, Ms. Gotemilla. That has been a very fascinating talk. Um, I would like to move uh, the conversation from um, technical and implementation issues to something more practical. Um, I studied um, translation and interpreting among uh, other things in my undergrad, and I was wondering uh, whether I could direct a question to you um, which uh, regards the format of the negotiation process. So I've watched uh, videos online about um, high-level negotiation processes and um, 
of course, uh, from an interpreter's point of view, fascinating, but uh, I believe that communication can be uh, impeded by uh, each delegation um, conversing in their uh, native language through the interpreters. So I was wondering whether um, negotiating a treaty like START or the new START uh, also allows for more personal setups where, for example, you and your counterpart Antonov get to speak in uh, the language of your choice just to speed up the process or whether this is completely unacceptable in such a situation. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Sophie, when I first started at Georgetown, I went to the Georgetown at the time School of Language and Linguistics. Uh, and that school doesn't exist anymore, but it was uh, designed to train interpreters and translators. And I thought I wanted to be a UN conference interpreter. I quickly found out I didn't have what it takes. It's hard work. So where are you studying or where have you studied? I studied translation and interpreting at the University of Vienna. And oh. now I'm a student, an MPhil student at the University of Oxford. That's great. Well, um, it's, uh, it is an excellent question. There is a certain uh, formality of the negotiations. Uh, in plenary session, you have uh, your um, interpreter, your lead interpreter at your side. Uh, she interprets uh, from English into Russian, she or he. I had several very good male interpreters. The Russians, as I mentioned, only had female interpreters. Uh, and uh, it's all very formal and it's consecutive interpretation. It's all very formal, but it's also good because, and this is why I urged uh, in my book that as a lesson learned, we should always ensure we on the US side that we have several Russian speakers on our delegation. And because the Russians have many English speakers on their delegation, I happen to have uh, several uh, Russian speakers who are excellent. And they basically, you can listen twice. You can listen to their original, which is often very, well, it's very informative because of the nuance. And then you can listen in English as well. And it helps to speed up comprehension uh, if you can listen twice. So that is one of the reasons why I do think it's important to have, uh, to have uh, both. Now in we had to work with consecutive interpretation constantly because even in the working groups and our plenary sessions broke into particular smaller working groups to handle technical matters like the verification protocol. But in my case, because um, I speak Russian and Antonov speaks English, we had heads of delegation meetings where we each had a bilingual note taker with us but we could just mix up the language constantly uh, speaking. You know, if I didn't know a, a technical term in Russian, I'd say it in English and vice versa. It really, it really sped up uh, the, the uh, speed of our interactions. We were responsible for problem solving across the negotiations. So if things couldn't get solved in the working groups, they came up to us. And I think it really helped in two ways. It helped just because we could communicate so much more quickly but it also helped because it was a mutual confidence builder that we had that confidence to, you know, I'm not a native Russian speaker. I make plenty of mistakes. He's not a native English speaker, you know, vice versa, but we had enough kind of respect for each other that we put up with each other's mistakes and, and just, you know, used it as a tool of, of communication in the most elemental way possible. So I do think that uh, it, it's very important to have native Russian speakers uh, in that kind of bilateral negotiation. I would argue for any negotiation, it would be important. There's a different phenomenon that foot now, a uh, foot now uh, in places like the EU and certainly at NATO where English is used all the time. I think for in native English speakers, that's an advantage to us, right? But I'm not sure it's 100% fair to everyone else, but that's a whole different debate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe we have time for these last two questions, but I'm going to invite Nadia and Jonathan to both ask their questions um, so that uh, you, you can answer them uh, both. Ruth, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for taking your time to speak to us today. Uh, my name is Nadia. I'm currently a student in the University of Oxford, um, but I'm originally from Moscow, and I would like to thank you for talking about um, your um, 
uh, the impact of you being a woman with a lot of Russian diplomats. Uh, but um, I would love to ask a question. How would, if you were to describe um, Russian style of negotiating in a sentence or maybe a couple of phrases, how would you do this? Thank you. Thank you, Alex, and um, thank you, Secretary um, Gottenmuller, for, for your very interesting discussion. Um, I'm a recent graduate of, of Georgetown University, and I'll be starting law school in the fall. Uh, my question deals with uh, L, uh, the legal advisor's office, in terms of, of these negotiations and, and treaties. You spoke a little bit about the, or well, quite a bit about the, not a little bit, quite a bit about the technical expertise of um, people who are dealing with these arms um, verifications and etc. To what extent does the legal uh, um, expertise come into these treaties or are these kind of like the people who are just brought in at the end to dot the I's and cross the T's? Thank you very much. Well, those are two great questions to end on. Thank you very much. I do apologize in advance and heads up to you, Alex. I'm going to have to go on to another meeting, right? when we finish up here. So I do apologize in advance. This has been a wonderful conversation and I thank you all very, very much. Uh, first for you, Nadia, I, you know, I think there are many, as many Russian negotiating styles as there are Russian negotiators. And that goes without saying. Uh, I think that goes for any, any uh, national group in a way because your negotiating style is so linked to your personality. Now, the Russian uh, diplomats do receive excellent training, better training than I think many do, certainly in my own country. There's not the attention to language acquisition, for example. In my experience, Russian diplomats really learn language as well. And so they have that edge in dealing with their counterparts that they, uh, either English speakers or if they are working with the Chinese, Chinese speakers. So that is really, really good. There's also some traditions of Russian diplomacy uh, that get played out. I mentioned again in the book, the old story about Khrushchev bragging that he could tell his foreign minister to sit on a block of ice until the other side gave way. It's that old thing about slow rolling <laughs> as a diplomatic tool and, and Russians are very good at it. But believe me, in my, in my career, I've known many slow rollers from other countries as well. So it's not unique to Russia, but I would say what differentiates the Russians um, uh, is the excellence of their training and particularly their language skills. Uh, the, not only the um, uh, Megimo, uh, the uh, International uh, Relations School in Moscow, uh, but also the uh, Diplomatic Academy, very, very excellent uh, training facilities. Um, Jonathan, your question is a good one because uh, people lose sight of, again, in this notion of drive-by negotiations, they lose sight of the full panoply of expertise that is needed to really turn out a quality treaty document. And the, the lawyers are so important to that. I had top-notch lawyers, uh, three of them spent most of the negotiating months with me. Some come, came and went depending on particular issues that had to be addressed. One of them now, uh, Mallory Stewart, is the senior director for uh, for um, arms control and nonproliferation on the National Security Council staff. So she was with us in, in Geneva. It's really necessary because the, for one thing, the document is the highest legal document of the land, uh, treaty, legally binding treaties that get the advice and consent of the Senate to their ratification are the highest legal documents of the land. They have to be right from a legal perspective. So it's very, very important. I hope for one that you will consider a, a career in state L because it can be extremely interesting. Although I have to say treaty law is uh, you know, not the only thing they do. They do all kinds of, of uh, substantive legal topics on behalf of the, of the State Department and the US government. So, but it's a great question and it just goes to show once again, I talked repeatedly about having former inspectors or weapon system operators on my team. I also needed linguists and separately translators. Uh, back to Sophie's question, uh, translators did the written work, interpreters did the, the spoken, the conference interpreting. But, and you need lawyers because the document has got to be right from the perspective of, of US domestic law. So, and international law as well. So thank you again, all for your questions. Really great uh, conversation today. Alex, back over to you.
Yeah, thank you, Rose. Thank you so much for your time. And on behalf of all the fellows in uh, Monterey Summer Symposium on Russia, uh, we're so grateful for your time and uh, wish you the best. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I have to run away. It was great talking to you all. Good luck with the, uh, with the following days of your uh, symposium. All the best.